<laughs> well, yeah. thank you everyone for joining us. Um, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day um, to, to come hear us talk and hopefully start a conversation. Um, our talk is just in general about lessons learned from building blockchains. And so we'll start, um, okay, uh, we'll start with a brief intro on Chainsafe. We'll define sustainability. We'll define uh, open source software. And then we'll discuss uh, briefly on the Linux Foundation and kind of things that we've learned from them. And then we'll discuss kind of our response to you know, our intent on building open source software from a truly sustainable place. And finally, um, we'll conclude um, our talk. So just a bit um, on us, uh, Greg and I are both co-founders at Chainsafe Systems and at Chainsafe, we're a blockchain research and development firm. We're just over 35 people and our mission is to build the infrastructure for Web3. Um, and so we'll briefly discuss kind of how we started, where we come from, and the projects we're currently working on. Um, and so I'll just jump right into it. Um, so this is the Ethereum Developers Meetup where I met most of my co-founders. Um, this was a small meetup here in Toronto. Um, and really it kind of allowed us to get to know each other, to learn from each other, and really kind of get our, um, our roots started here in the city. Um, and so this is the library where we used to rent space out um, before we had an office or anything even remotely close to that, um, where we would kind of in the back of the library um, here in Toronto just meet to have a small space that we could, you know, pretend to call our own. <laughs> um, I don't so think this, this is one of our co-founders building. Yeah. I don't think the slides are moving from you. The slides aren't working. Okay, so how about I share? Okay, cool. Um, because I, I have it in yeah. center mode as well. So let me just do that. I'll just keep it nice and old school and go through the, through them myself. Um, yeah, so just hello. Um, this is just our short agenda. Um, yeah, this is our the original Theorem Developers Meetup where we all met. Um, this is the library I briefly spoke about. Um, and then, yeah, this is when we kind of got a little bit more serious. This was our first real office. And this is the Ethereum Developers Meetup about a year and a half ago, um, being held in our office. Um, we're now co-organizing co it. And really the point of, of this kind of half of the presentation, or this kind of third quarter, however you want to slice it, um, is to basically illustrate kind of the full circle of what it's like to really kind of come from the community and then you know try as much as possible to give back to that community that gave you everything. Um, so for us, it's really important to never kind of forget our roots and to continue to provide kind of the foundation that led to, to us. Um, so, you know, more than anything, we're extremely proud of how that process has come and, you know, how organic it has been to continue to grow. Um, and so this was at ETH Waterloo. This was since our retreat last summer, which it doesn't seem like unfortunately due to COVID, we'll be having a retreat this year, but there are bigger problems. Um, this was the most people we had together um, in a while. Like I said, we're just over 35 people now. Um, so this was really nice to just, you know, be with a bunch of people and be able to kind of spend some time together. Um, and so, yeah, like pretty plainly put, our mission is to be building the infrastructure for Web3. Um, at Chainsafe, that means a lot of building blockchains at, at it, our core. And beyond that, our focus is on, you know, making those blockchains usable for people as much as possible. And that means really breaking the barriers that exist right now that only truly allow subject matter experts to excel in the space. You know, more than anything, we really need to ensure that the actual developers that come to our space don't need to spend years learning the fundamentals and can instead focus on the things that will bring mass adoption um, because we're really far from that being a reality at the moment and we're just excited to have the opportunity to be that bridge for the community as much as possible so just to discuss a few of our projects um lodestar 
and these are all, all these projects kind of I'm gonna be discussing them in uh, in order of when we started them and just to be clear that these are projects that you know exist under our organization and these are kind of things that we work with partners with on um, through grants and stuff like that but you know these are development efforts led by us um, and so Lodestar. Lodestar is a TypeScript implementation of the beacon chain um, but more than that I'd say that it's really the JavaScript slash TypeScript ecosystem for ETH 2.0 um, and so working on things like light clients for example um, lots of libraries to allow people to build web applications and also of course um, a full node as well and so this is something we're extremely proud of and something we're proud to be recipients of grants from the Ethereum Foundation for and excited to be continuing with that work now that there's a multi-client testnet and there's really a lot of um, a lot of momentum with with the project and with kind of the projects in general surrounding ETH2, we're really excited about the development of it and where it's going. Um, Gossamer, so Go Gossamer is a Golang implementation of the Polkadot host. Um, so yeah, this slide is a bit old, forgive me for not updating it. I just realized right now. Um, but yeah, the Polkadot host is basically what you would need to build a parachain that connects to the Polkadot ecosystem. So this, as well, is a super exciting project for us. And this really goes back to how we started. We started out a lot uh, by doing a lot of sidechain implementations. And so when we learned about Polkadot, um, for us, it was you know a dream come true to not necessarily need to just fork a piece of software that was meant to do something completely different, rather develop a framework for doing things that um, are meant to be done. Um, so for us we're really excited to be providing kind of this for the polka dot ecosystem into the blockchain ecosystem as a whole um we're really proud to be recipients from the web3 foundation for this work and also proud for our general kind of contributions to the polka dot ecosystem um, with our we're doing a lot of work with centrifuge on our bridge that we'll discuss a bit later which also received a grant from the web3 foundation um, we're doing work with polymath um, as well. And so just in general, we're really kind of excited to be doing as much as possible to bring that ecosystem forward. Um, and so ETC support. So we started out uh, with kind of getting into the ETC um, ecosystem by bringing the former, like the what what is not used anymore in the ETC ecosystem, but what was the Go client. Um, and so we brought that kind of up to the hard fork to, to be ready for the hard fork that was um, a few hard forks ago um, and since then we've been adding etc support to hyperledger basu which has been extremely exciting to be able to actually um, interact with the hyperledger ecosystem to be able to write some java and just build things that are meant for you know uh, modularity um, and just really kind of high scalability um, in terms of just what the use cases are for something like Besu. Um, so it's been a real kind of privilege to do that work, and that's been with support from, um, from the uh, ETC cooperative. Um, and just, uh, yeah, the, the work with uh, the other kind of uh, ETC stuff was with ETC Labs. Um, and so AirChain. So Ethermint is a project that basically takes Ethereum, specifically the EVM, and uh, brings it into the, kind of the Cosmos SDK as a module and layers on top of it Tendermint consensus. So for us, this is a really exciting project because it makes the ability to build scalable um, blockchains that are EVM compatible and can you know, utilize and port over pre-existing smart contracts um, and all the utilities um, due to RPC being uh, you know, under the hood uh, extremely compatible um, with Web3.js just makes this project really exciting and also a huge opportunity for people like Aragon um, to be able to deploy um, their own blockchain utilizing their pre-existing tooling and smart contracts. So this has been an extremely exciting project to work on 
and one that we applied to work on through a DAO proposal. So a pretty incredible process in terms of how it came about um, in terms of getting it approved by the DAO. Um, you know, so you can kind of read all about that and kind of go through um, the proposal and kind of see where we're at. Sit in following that project more. Um, on the Aragon Discord, you can come say hi. Um, so this is the latest project we've started working on, which is a Rust Filecoin node implementation. Um, so right now we're focused on specifically a, um, uh, oh, sorry, and just about Ethermint, that work was done with the grant from the Interchain Foundation. Um, so to go back to Filecoin, um, we're currently working with a grant from Protocol Labs on a verifier node for the Filecoin ecosystem which is extremely excited, exciting and is something that we'll be working towards having a full node implementation. Um, and so more than anything, Filecoin is a project that brings an incredible amount of utility to the blockchain space and to decentralized applications in general. Um, for the first time ever, you'll truly be able to have a full stack decentralized app that can be verified um, to be fully decentralized and so, you know, the capacity for that to um, make incredible strides in what it is we do and to not have to rely on the Web2 world is um, beyond miraculous and going to be something truly revolutionary for a lot of what we do um, and a lot of what the, the community does. Um, to be able to have um, distributed, decentralized um, file store like that is uh, you know, the dream come true. And so for us to be able to have an impact on something like that is an incredible honor and something we're really excited about um, moving forward. And so all of these projects you can go check out on our GitHub, github.com slash chainsafe, and learn more about them, get involved. Um, we usually have good first issues if you're interested in contributing. Um, if you want to create issues because something went wrong, that too um, would be extremely helpful. But just in general, um, we're on Discord as well. So you on our Discord server, you can come say hi and come talk about any of the projects I just spoke about. So just to get back into kind of the main focus of the talk, um, really sustainability is something that matters a lot to us. You know, coming from a meetup, and really just being here to build out the ecosystem. For us, more than anything, sustainability is what matters most. And so from Wikipedia, this why not from Wikipedia? Um, it's pretty fitting. Um, sustainability is the ability to exist constantly. And so that's a really important kind of uh, core value of ours is to do everything sustainably and to ensure that, you know, we're not just building cool stuff for the sake of building them, rather we're doing it with the assumption that, and with the kind of use cases that are gonna be leveraging this technology and allow the technology, the open source software to exist beyond its current um, world that it's living in. Um, and so that, you know, is a, again, a real core value of ours and one that guides the reason, for example, we've decided to build the bridge in the way that we have, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, and so just discuss, to discuss what we see as a definition for open source software, since we're going to be speaking about it a lot, um, is that it's software distributed under a license that meets certain criteria. So it is available in source, so source code form, excuse me. Open source may be modified and distributed without additional permission. The criteria may apply to its use and redistribution. Um, so that's from the Linux blog on what is open source. So just to kind of understand what those kind of three criteria really add up to, and that's sponsors like these. So currently the platinum sponsors for the Linux Foundation are a bunch of different organizations that otherwise compete with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. These are organizations that, you know, you look at them and you see absolute enemies. Um, ones that you couldn't believe are actually contributing to an organization together and see value in working together. 
beyond, you know, just pure competition, which is, you know, what we're expected to assume is necessary to succeed um, in the corporate world. And so what are what are we learning from that as an organization? Oops. Let's just get that. What are we learning from that as an as an organization? Uh, for us, you know, if we're not able to get competitors to see value beyond zero th sum thinking, not only will we lose, but the blockchain ecosystem will lose as well. The tribalist approach to blockchain will get us nowhere because it'll just mean that a lot of people have incredible projects that no one will ever ever learn about because they're too busy focusing on their projects and their projects and their projects. And so more than anything, it is crucial and paramount for the success of this ecosystem for us to all not only work together, but to see where we can actually collaborate on specific infrastructural pieces that bring us closer and that allow us to unite beyond just um, what we assume to be the necessary competitive nature of success. Um, so our response to this is Chainbridge. So Chainbridge is currently supported by four projects, um, Centrifuge um, with support from a Web3 Foundation grant, um, Aragon Chain, which brings in the Cosmos ecosystem and is supported by Aragon, um, ETC, which is supported by ETC Labs, and Celo, which is our latest project to, to start working with. Um, and so these projects are working together to allow us to build a piece of software that shares infrastructure. And Greg will go over the architecture shortly. And so these projects together are seeing value in sharing infrastructure across these different kind of specific use cases. So not only do costs get lowered, but the sustainability of the software overall is increased. And so beyond just this notion of building bridges one-to-one, -one, we're now able to add value across a multitude of blockchains, Ethereum as well, that now bring additional value to each of these projects beyond intended use cases for these specific bridges. Um, and it's something that, yeah, I mean, we couldn't be more proud of. Uh, basically with what Ian said, um, you know, we have support from, you know, four different chains right now, uh, support for five chains um, and four partners. Um, and, you know, we set out with three main goals uh, and you'll notice you don't see decentralization or trustlessness on this because that's sort of a given. That's what we that's where we want to be regardless. Um, but we have three main goals that are really important to us um, on why we built this. Um, so for some background, you know, we've built bridges many times for clients before. And also we built a bridge back when we launched the Gurley chain to burn testnet ETH. I mean, we learned a lot from back then because those bridges went one way. Those bridges, basically, when I created a new bridge, uh, and even today, you know, you see like it's ETH to Bitcoin, um, or you'll see like a Polkadot to Ethereum or a Cosmos to Ethereum. So, to, and they're always one way, um, and people keep creating new ones. So, one of our first goals was that if we're going to build this bridge, we're going to build it right the first time, and that means we're going to make it so that you can easily integrate new chains. Um, with with ease with backwards compatibility so that means you know if i add chain xyz to tomorrow it should still have be able to interop with all the other chains that were added previous to it um and so on and so forth um that was one of our main main goals um the second one was the ability to transfer between multiple chains so although it's great that there's support for multiple chains it doesn't do much if i can't go Let's say I'm running Chainbridge on this bridge on all four um, on four different chains. It's not doesn't do us much if I can only transfer between one to one. Uh, and that was one of the goals we set out. We set out so that our data, whatever data we're transferring across, could be transferable and go from chain A to B to C to D and then come back to chain A should it want to. We didn't want to put a restriction on that. Because that was the big thing. If, if even if this supported from chain A to chain B, but now I had to get a new relayer set, you know, if I wanted to go A to C or or B to A, um, that that wouldn't really do much for us because that's a lot of overhead for the people operating them. And then we start losing. There's a lot of metrics to calculate. There's a lot of different like how much is actually going across. Are people using it? It's not great. The intention from the get go is that we want to build it so that, you know, you can run with one relayer set 
across all these different chains and you can choose where to go and when to go. Um, and that was, that's really also really important to us because, you know, as Aiden was talking about, how can we ensure that we're like supporting each other everywhere? And if we can get all these different blockchains working together on this idea and this ideology and they can transfer amongst everyone, um, it also means that integrations become a lot easier. Um, and as peep integration, you know, you come in and say, hey, I want this specific feature, you know, the idea is it should be able to be added with backwards compatibility to all the other blockchains as well, um, pretty effectively and easily. Um, and this is good for cost and also for time to like deploy new, new features um, and deploy whatever needs to get done. Um, and that was really important to us because we want to make sure that as many people can use this, um, as many different blockchains that emerge can also have easy access to using this. Um, and our third one, which I, which we believe to be pretty unique um, in the ideology of how it came to be, um, is modular security. So in bridge designs, typical bridge designs have, you know, the idea that chain A to chain B, B to A will be uh, like an SPV proof or an inclusion proof or, uh, or some sort of inclusion proof. Uh, or it could be something like a, uh, as simple as just voting, right? A voting scheme, like a threshold voting scheme. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is actually the, the destination chain. So the data moving to that final hop. So from A to B, it's only chain B that cares about how it's retrieving that data. So what we dis, uh, the way we designed it and the way we're continually to develop it is that the security is designated, is uh, decided upon by the actual destination chain. So should the deployer of the contracts or application specific application specific code, you know, if you're Cosmos SDK or Substrate, for instance, um, you would decide how that security guarantee happens. And it, you don't have to care about really how the other chains are doing it, because as long as it's how you're okay with how you're receiving your assets, then you shouldn't have an issue. Um, and obviously you can block which destination chains you're going to and stuff. And that's like through whitelisting, that's another topic. Um, and this is super important to us because imagine a situation where, you know, um, and I use this one because it's, uh, I, I've been asked a few times, well, you know, this kind of sounds like IBC or something like that. Um, and IBC uses light clients, which is like, makes it a lot easier to do verifications. And similarly, a lot of bridge designs try to aim for that light client approach. Well, there's some chains that it just doesn't make a lot of sense, um, or it's like very difficult to actually do two way proofs like that. For instance, if you want to go Ethereum, the chances of you proving the DAG on Ethereum would actually be quite difficult or expensive. Um, and you probably wouldn't want to go. The idea is like you could in theory um, or you could do, for instance, an inclusion proof on chain B and relayer threshold voting on chain A, right? So if you send an asset to chain B, chain B would say, hey, give me the block headers from chain A and let me go and do my proof on them to ensure that everything's accurate and the data seems correct. Um, and that's like one of the really cool ideas behind this because it allows us to also grow the bridge. And it also allows us that, uh, you know, people that integrate it don't get locked in. They don't get locked into one solution right out of the gate. Um, and it allows us to really adapt to the needs. So to basically use whatever blockchain the integration is for, it allows them to basically use the best possible security measure they have available to them. And that to us was like super important. Um, and that was like why I discussed, like really want to focus on that as like, you know, one of our big goals. Um, next slide. I guess I don't have access to that. <laughs> Normally, you know, there's like a clicker. <laughs> uh, um, Cool. So um, just quick, some high level stuff here, just to like, go over everything and feel free to ask me questions like in the chat. I'll just kind of stop halfway through and answer if you got them. Um, high level, like the, the idea behind it, just to like reiterate this idea of like being able to go multiple directions is we, we have like a core component. Um, and within that, we have a routing service and that's what we call it, the router here. Uh, and, and then we have two pieces, a listener and a writer. Very standard, you know, the listener actually listens to on-chain related events um, and the writer simply writes the chain, uh, writes a message, signed message or a signed transaction to chain to do whatever operations. And our structure is like pretty simple because what we've done is we've found a messaging protocol that I'll go into in a second that allows us to basically say, okay, you don't need to know anything about the other chain. All you need to know is what the chain ID is and that's something unique to Chainbridge I'll get into. Um, and you just need to know 
uh, be able to format the data according to the transfer type. So we do have some set transfer types and then we have a generic transfer. So the set transfer types are to kind of cover some more specific cases um, where the generic allows you to do whatever you want in the common use cases like the inclusion proofs. Um, and basically the listener would just simply take all the data that it gets from the events, format it accordingly to meet the, the, the structure, pass it off to the core of the router and the router would get routed to the according destination chain. Now the writer itself, based on the chain, it would do different things. For instance, a substrate chain and an EVM based chain aren't gonna do, be able to you know, handle the data the exact same way. So the writer is gonna reformat that message payload accordingly so that it can perform the actions uh, it needs to do. Um, and this like, again, is like where some of the, you know, some of the bulk of the work when it comes to actually doing some integrations comes in. Um, but this also allows us to have the backwards compatibility that we talked about, because as long as we're conforming to this protocol this whole time, we're never gonna run into issues where, you know, we add a new feature. Only thing you gotta do is if you have to add a new transfer type, you know, assuming it's not covered already. Um, and that's great. Uh, chances are like, you know, you might only as a DAP, as a builder, you know, of an e in an ecosystem, and you want to build a DAP or whatever on top of this, um, it's, it's fairly extensible. And I'll get into that in the next slide. Two more slides. So, hop to this one. Yeah. So I kind of explained this a little bit. Basically, like the flow would be like chain A triggers an event, and this is pretty standard for most bridging designs. You know, chain A triggers an event. Our listener picks it up, formats it according to the message, and then we route it off to the writer. And the key thing to hear is like. You know, a, an EVM-based listener would doesn't know about the EVM writer. Again, it's just passing it off. It has no idea what its destination is, and that's something important to us to this design that a lot of other designs don't, because a lot of other designs assume the security model, assume all sorts of like little factors that make it a very you know A to B type of bridge, um, and that's something we're trying to avoid um, and continually making sure we don't uh, get ourselves in a situation of. Right, uh, that's a good question, the router. So the router, we're actually calling this like the actual bridge software. This is like the off-chain mechanics. Um, and those we call the end, you know, in order to run one, you need to be, you also need a private key that can, you know, write to the given chain. Um, we call them relayers. Uh, you could think of them as a validator as well. Um, it's just an easier term for us to call them relayers. And based on you know the security model it, it would be different in our current iteration um, and we're already working on the inclusion proofs right now um, but in our current iteration we use a bit of a trusted setup um, just to get it going and because we use threshold voting now in theory we can just add anybody we want to that um, and threshold voting is as simple as you set you know how many votes you need out of the total the total relayer set to to include to execute a deposit um, and basically the idea is, you know, we create a proposal to execute. And then when the proposal gets voted on um, based on the accuracy of the data, then once we've reached that threshold, we can then go and execute it. Now, in theory, we could combine threshold proposals with the inclusion proofs, um, which is something we're looking at. So like, you know, it might take that extra block, perhaps, uh, could do it in one block, um, but it gives you that extra guarantee that at least more than one relayer has verified uh, the, the data coming through. Does that make sense? No problem. I love this. I like interactiveness. Um, yeah, so just to talk about the messaging protocol, we've tried to make it super lean um, so that later on we can add things if we need to, um, but we think we've done a good job at keeping it together. Uh, basically, as I was talking about before, we have a source and a destination and you notice they're called chain IDs. This isn't like an Ethereum chain ID or network ID or anything like that. This is just simply something internal that we use when we load our config file on the relayer software to do everything. So we just map everything. For instance, like Ethereum and Centrifuge could have one chain ID one and two respect respectively, the ETC three, so on and so forth. Um, it's just for semantics to make it easier so then the router can pass it off. Um, we have a transfer type. Typically, most transfers go on the generics, although we do have some specific ones like for ERC looking like lookalike token um, to make it a little bit easier to make a transfer for a token. Um, although you could do it through generic, it, it's just a lot easier to like specify it this way. Um, we have a deposit nonce. This is simply to help us uh, protect against like duplicate proposals. Um, and so like that kind of realm of like the security side, 
resource ID in a second. And then we have payload. Payload is just a generic byte array, essentially, at the end of the day, that allows us to, um, based on the transfer types, manipulate the data and get the, current, the correct data that we need. So it, it helps us be a little bit really generic. Um, resource ID is something cool, and this helps us solve the problem of, now it might not seem obvious, but there's a, there's a problem of going from chain A to B to C. Chain A to B is very straightforward because we know if I, for instance, let's use a token or an NFT. So if I have a token, uh, an NFT on chain A, and I want to get bring it to chain B, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you, you lock it up, the, the bridge would take custody of that NFT, uh, and then we would go like, hey, this is one to one, you know, this one's out of circulating supply technically because no one can transfer it, and now in circulating supply. But what happens if I go chain A to B and then now to C? And this is what our resource ID uh, came to solve. So it, it's structured by uh, the chain ID as the prefix and then a unique string right after. And the idea is when a deposit comes in, it checks the chain ID to actually identify, figure out what to do with it and then uses a unique string to create mappings to the data that gets created on that chain. That way, when we go to deposit it, um, we know whether it's from that or deposited or transferred. We know if it's from that chain or not. We know where it originated from. Um, and so on and so forth. So it helps it at, be able to go A, B, C, D, E, back to A, to C, to D. Um, and there's a lot more uh, posts. If you go to change hybrid, um, you can find a lot more information about how that logic is structured. Um, and we're constantly releasing more stuff. Um, but that's what our resource ID is. And we think it's really great because it actually helps solve that problem and gives us the ability for you to run this bridge against multiple chains and have your users basically say, I, I want to go to ETC this transaction, this next transaction goes to a substrate one, uh, a Cosmos one, a, you know, a Celo one, really doesn't matter. Um, and it lets you just like interchangeably go through them all. Um, question from Hernando, uh, how do you get this, how, you, how do you get into the set of router voters? Is there some sort of deposit required? Right, so in this iteration uh, in, of the threshold proposal, basically um, you instantiate Let's say it's a smart contract, you instantiate a smart contract with the addresses of who are going to be the relayers um, that are going to vote on it. And basically, they can then add, continually add more, remove different validators or relayers, sorry. Next slide. Um, to go over the architecture, ooh, I hope everyone can see this. It's a little blurry. Um, but to kind of give you an idea of like, the genericness around what we've done. Um, I'm using the EVM because I feel like most people are more familiar with that than they would be of like, you know, a substrate pallet, for instance. Um, so this is a bit of an easier, more digestible diagram, I think. Yeah, no worries. Great. Glad you got the answer, Hernando. Um, yeah, so basically uh, in the top left corner, we got a big box. That's blockchain A in the bottom it's not hard to zoom in. It's good. Oh, okay, awesome. Um, and in the bottom box, we got blockchain B. So we're doing an A, B example in this diagram. Um, there's a legend in the bottom left if you need that. Basically what's happening here is we're gonna show you how actually transfers happen and where the genericness of the, the bridge actually occurs uh, from the on-chain perspective. Um, basically what we've got is we've got our bridge uh, contract um, on an EVM chain. And basically Alice makes a deposit. We're gonna assume, I believe this is an ERC-20 example, uh, due to ERC20s, you have to make an approve. So there's two transactions made by Alice, one to approve the bridge, the next to actually do the transfer. After that, Alice doesn't do anything. Um, basically what happens is the bridge routes that data to the respective handler. Um, that's chosen based on the transfer type. Um, that handler would take that payload from the previous message struct that I just showed you guys um, and basically uh, decodes it. Now handlers are a uh, unique idea or are like way to get around generics. Um, and the idea is simply put that we have an interface for handlers that has execute and deposit. Deposit is for you know getting ready to transfer and execute is when you wanna actually redeem on the destination chain. And basically, because our payload is a byte array, we're actually able, the handlers then go and deal with how to decode that payload data. Um, and that's how they can do all their unique stuff. So. Um, from there, in this example of the ERC-20 handler, it basically decodes it, figures out who the sender is and all that data and the amount and the token address, uh, takes custody of that asset, and then fires off an event. When that event gets fired off, we have uh, one of our relayers just simply propose it. This is pretty standard bridging stuff. Um, they propose on the blockchain B, 
hey, here's my proposal. And now they propose with a hash of the data because we don't want to reveal all the assets right out of the gate. Um, and then from that, they go, the other relayers go and vote on the data and the accuracy. Once the voting has been uh, concluded, then basically somebody goes and calls the execute function uh, against um, all of the, uh, with, with all the data. And then we re-verify the hash against the proposal and so on and so forth. We mint you a new token, assuming it's not from that chain. Um, that's kind of like a very rough idea of how it all flows. Um, we're currently in the works of like kind of doing everything offline. So basically uh, using um, kind of trying to shield the voting and also shielding the data um, and posting it so it all happens in one transaction. If anybody's interacted with the Gnosis safe, for instance, recently, uh, it, like it's the same idea. You know, you don't, you're just signing away messages. You're not signing to chain to reduce fees and also just um, get us closer to like more of our decentralized idea where we want this to be like more of a network moving around. Um, and I guess while I say that there's no token, there's no Chainbridge token, there's no Chainbridge blockchain, so to speak. Um, we're using just simple cryptography and simple message passing to actually like achieve all this. Um, and that's roughly how the bridge works. Um, we're, we're currently constantly iterating. Um, our goals right now are, I guess, we're like our V2. Um, I, I don't have the tag releases. We haven't what they're going to be might be like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, but you know, our V2 as we're approaching it is going to decentralize a lot of this, um, get closer to decentralizing a lot of this and pushing towards inclusion proofs, which will help us make get more trustless. Um, we're expecting that to be within a month, um, two months. And then um, right now, you know, we're going for, uh, we're doing our first round of security audits on, on, on the base layer stuff. So that um, should be concluding and probably two, two weeks, three weeks, um, and then we'll be going live, uh, which will be super awesome. And at that point, you'll be able to go from, you know, as, as Aiden said before, centrifuge, GTC, Cosmos-based chains that include Ethermint uh, as an SDK module, um, and, and EVM-based chains in general, um, like uh, Ethereum and ETC. So super excited. Um, that's kind of the architecture. If I've got any questions, super happy to answer them. Um, if it's like security stuff too, like by all means. Otherwise, uh, what's the next slide, Aiden? I don't think that's mine. Yeah, no, that's the slide. Like, like, yeah, so. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, sorry, I hadn't been looking at the chat. I just kind of caught up on everything right now. Um, but yeah, thanks for that, Greg. And I guess just our last slide is just to conclude it all. Um, so, you know, without learning the history of open source, it's pretty easy to think that good intention uh, is what has fueled this movement, when in reality, the fuel for this movement is economic cooperation. Very simply put, people uniting for a cause that makes sense for them and their businesses and for the value of their communities has been what has allowed open source to proliferate and for something like the Linux Foundation to exist. And so to think that it'll be any different for blockchains, um, we feel is just a bit... Um, uh, out of touch with the realities of open source. And it's the need to think beyond zero th sum thinking and to really see a future in which information and value are flowing through the blockchain world and through the internet in general in a truly interoperable way. Um, and so that's basically it for our talk. We have, uh, we have some time left to kind of take as ma many questions as you have um, if you want to hit us up on Twitter, send us an email, um, visit our website, check us out on GitHub, it's all there. Um, we'll leave up this page. But yeah, that's basically it for our talk. Um, thank you all for, for joining us. And I just I get, I guess we can't stress enough how important it is for us to allow for something like this to be, um, yeah, I'm going to link it right now, to be more of a standard for arbitrary messaging to be, you know, something that is interoperable both on the tech side of things, but also on the community side of things. So making it easy for people to interact with, making it simple um, for individuals to contribute to, to, um, you know, add listeners, add writers, um, make this as, um, you know, accessible as it possibly can be. So we're always looking for feedback from users. We're always looking for new potential partner integrations. Um, yeah, beyond anything, we're really excited about what uh, what the future holds for something like this because we see it, you know, very much 
um, having uh, you know a lot of value add to things that are already existing from an interoperability perspective, like um, you know that like what's happening in Polkadot and this is something that allows those two to each other. Uh, still focus on the kind of extreme security guarantees that they provide for their own ecosystems. And so for us, this is about providing um, value across different kind of um, levels of security, different levels of modularity, and something that we feel like will be crucial for the future of blockchains in general and the internet. Um, there's Greg, question. there's another question. Yeah, on that. Yeah, Hernando. Yeah, no. So actually, uh, there, there's a basic fee model right now, simply that like you can just associate a fee per deposit um, until we actually get to, and that's part of the next iteration. So once we actually start doing like more off-chain based stuff, uh, the idea is, you know, we'll start pushing, we're, we're, our, we're pushing towards a, um, sorry, not the off-chain, sorry, the decentralized, like trustless side. Um, as we start pushing more decentralized, the idea is we want to be actually remove threshold voting in general and allow anybody to become a relayer, in which case um, the idea of having uh, the uh, staked back relaying um, it will be included, and then that way we can adjust the fees accordingly. Um, one of the big things, though, right now is, is the off-chain portion. So once we get the off-chain, we can do everything in one transaction. Um, the ability for us to actually reduce the fees and then you have more uh, adjustable fees on to go is is kind of the intention. Um, but I'm not quite there, but we do have it right now. So yes, there is there is a fee take right now. Yeah, but just to be clear, you know, I can't stress enough, like there won't be a blockchain for this. Um, there won't be a token for this. You know, we plan on allowing for native tokens to provide that um, that piece. And, you know, we have a lot of stuff we're cooking up to to make that all happen. And we're really excited about, um, yeah, the potential that that will bring to different networks that have no notion of each other to be able to communicate. And like to reiterate that one, like, you know, again, um, something that we, oh, could you do something like gas station or with fees? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, like, yeah, like, so the idea of like gas station network would be that basically you can shoot off the sign transaction from the relayer to the guys at the gas station. Yes. In theory we could, um, ultimately the PR that we've got actually brewing right now, that going right now and getting some PRs already would actually remove the need for that because the idea is, um, the relayers offline, much like in a blockchain, would be collecting all the different sign messages, um, basically signaling whether they're in favor or not in favor. Um, and then we put once like we've hit our threshold, um, all of them would get posted at the exact same time in in one transaction. Uh, so that way, you know, the idea of needing a get relay a gas station network wouldn't probably be needed, um, but could be used in theory. Um, you know, if a relayer doesn't want to actually hold the funds themselves. So we still have about 10 minutes left, I think. I'm not, I think we have a full hour. Um, so if anyone does have any more questions, happy to answer them. Or if anyone has any, you know, anything to say, funny gifts, whatever. <laughs> we got some time. Question. <laughs> um, so we have a, this is a very interesting project in the sense that we, because we have so many different integrations going on, um, there's actually like security audits that are, are triggering at different times as well. Um, so, and because we have changes coming in, there's different. So the way our release scheduling is working right now, we're taking our first one after this next, uh, after the security audit goes through um, in the next few weeks. Um, and then we're also breaking out some of the, the chain specific code from within the core relayer um, and creating it more of like a Lego style, you know, you add in the ones you want. Um, so if you only want to validate between Ethereum and, and like ETC or Ethereum and substrate, so to speak, you know, you could specify just those two, you know, one relay is doing these, one relay is doing these, or if you want to do all three, you can do them that way. Um, the idea and doing so will help us like make the releases a little bit different. So it's like, we'll cut a release per chain that way. So it'll help a lot better. And then that way the core only gets updated when we actually need to do like more decentralized based stuff. 
um, you know, if we're trying to decentralize it further or add like more trust, different trustless models to it, um, that's how the release would work. Um, but they'd all be independent. Um, it, it would, we've been kind of muddling over the last two weeks about how to actually narrow that down. Um, and then that's, that's where we're at right now with that. Um, got a question. Oh, oh, I should. Okay. Yeah. Thanks Fernando. I'll repeat those questions out loud. So that was, that question was about what is the release cycle going to be like? Um, got a question from uh, that's how would a developer get the progress update between different block times and transaction confirmations? Sounded like you wait and execute at all the same time, but wouldn't the need for confirmations at different times? Between different block times. Ah, I think I understand this question. Um, so I believe the question kind of is relating around like uh, similar how exchanges have a delay, right? So exchanges say, hey, we want to, before whatever, we need a confirmation window to prove that, you know, there's no deep reorgs or this isn't a, this isn't a part of a reorg or whatever. Um, yeah, so that can be set and adjusted to um, on chain. So that's up to like the actual users to, deter to determine that. So, um, and it's something we've been discussing. It's something we're adding in um, because from our auditors found that out. Oh, okay. Another question. How do you prioritize your work? Take that one. Sorry. I mean, yeah. yeah, so we're, oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, our, our team is you know, over 35 people. Um, so, you know, beyond even the stuff that we've spoken about, um, we have other things we're working on as well. Um, so yeah, just to be clear, you know, we have individual teams working on all of these things. So for example, though someone on the Gossamer side of things, could be providing, you know, some architectural kind of reasoning and, and kind of mind sharing. Um, there's a specific team working on Chainbridge. Um, the person who happened to work on the substrate palette was was a contributor to Gossamer, which is our implementation of the Polkadot host previously. Um, but you know that team has grown way beyond when project. Um, so really, we are kind of prioritizing all of this by having individual teams um, working on each and every one of those things. Um, and then, yeah, like, I mean, our mission is pretty clear and cut. We are building the infrastructure for Web3. And so we prioritize work that we believe um, will provide that kind of, no pun intended, bridge to the Web3 future. Um, and so the things that we work on, we're absolutely passionate about and truly believe that they will have a positive in impact on the internet and on human organization in general. Um, so, you know, we're absolutely prioritizing blockchains that we feel um, will provide um, huge amounts of value. And that doesn't mean that we're not learning about different blockchains every day and learning about different projects that we want to be contributing to it each and every day. Um, like for example, uh, Merrick from Cello, he did a lunch and learn at our office on video chat you know a few months ago and now we're working on integrating cello through a, a grant um to our bridge and so you know it took us time to learn about that project and once we learned about it we knew that that's something we wanted to contribute to um so yeah i mean though we're learning about things each and every day um the priority is is very clear in our mind and that's to build things that will have true impact on the ecosystem and the and human organization as a whole to repeat myself Oh, I guess to, to talk to Hernando's uh, comment, um, how do you uh, how do you prioritize your work for various blockchains? Is there a sort of preference to a particular chain for technological reasons? Um, but yeah, I mean it is a diplomatic response. I mean, as you saw with the open uh, with the Linux Foundation sponsors, I mean diplomacy is how open source software exists. This notion that there will only be one chain to uh, to survive is pretty contradictory to the ideas of decentralization and how can that make sense? It, it just, it's, it's almost laughable to be honest when people think that there should only be one chain that proliferates when in reality that would lead to centralization which has led to this entire movement. Um, and so yeah, I, I personally believe sure it might be diplomatic but it's also a reality um, of the world that not everything can solve everything 
Um, like not anything can solve everything. Um, rather, there needs to be a specific thing used to solve a specific problem. Problem, and that only together do we all kind of succeed. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just hoping you appre you appreciate kind of where we're coming from and and how we we view this and us to dimension who supports the Linux Foundation and that you know these are people that um, aren't supposed to be friends yet they're each spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to ensure that a piece of software that underpins what they do um, succeeds and so beyond anything we need to kind of learn from those things or we will be doomed in my opinion We just have a couple more minutes left, so if there's any other questions, we'd be happy to discuss them, technical, non-technical. Again, if it's a cat meme or something, still have a couple minutes. Cool, so maybe we'll just leave it at that. Um, our information is up on that slide, so if you want to get in contact with us, if you want to just check out the code, um, yeah, please do. That would be the best thing ever. Um, so, yeah, we've been... You know, really excited to be able to give this talk. It's our first kind of online conference that we're participating in, and this will probably be the new normal. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been really fun and really appreciate all of you from taking the time out of your day to uh, to get involved and, and learn about what it is we're doing. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. I really appreciate that. <laughs> right. Have a great day. Have a good one. See y'all soon on the internet or one day maybe.